Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. So the title of my presentation today is Godzilla Konmari Hula Girls, Building Resilience in Post-311 Japan and then also beyond. The Japanese lifestyle magazine An An has enjoyed much popularity among young women since its launch in 1970. Along with glossy pictures and numerous advertisements, it has offered countless tips on topics ranging from clothing to makeup to sex, setting fashion trends and finding female consumerism. Shortly after the March 11 disaster in 2011, a compound disaster of earthquake, tsunami and nuclear accidents that devastated Tohoku, the magazine published a special issue, the book for women's disaster preparation, wisdom and then items for self-protection in unpredictable circumstances with the English subtitle that you see down at the bottom, Girls Life Skill, listing a variety of emergency goods women need to prepare for future calamities. The magazine's discussion provides a fascinating read on gender culture and disaster. The very first item on the list of emergency supplies is feminine sanitary napkins. Although the evacuation facilities might have this provision in store, women have different size, thickness, and brand preferences. They should figure out how many and what kinds they need for each cycle and then stock up on them in advance. Having a sufficient supply provides a sense of security, anshinkan, a crucial element in crisis management that really emphasized, among other things, the management of heart. Another item the magazine recommends is all-in-one cream or multi-purpose cream that you see on the right side of the screen in a red jar. Useful for more than one purpose, it will reduce not only the number of makeup items women carry in their emergency bags, but also the psychological distress women experience as a result of having a rough complexion. Other items recommended by the magazine include disposable laundry, deodorant sheet, face wash, and then hand mirrors. Nearly 50 emergency items are identified in this manner, defining girls' life skill in deeply gendered and then also bodily manner. In the aftermath of the March 11 disaster, or 3-11, discussions on readiness and then preparedness proliferated in Japan, emphasizing self-help jijo and mutual help kyojo over government help kojo and enunciating national resilience, so-called kokudo kyojinka, as a new national doctrine. And this is one of the government-issued poster featuring Sasaki Norio, the head coach of Nadeshiko Japan, a uh, Japanese women's national uh, soccer team. In this new cultural regime, housewives were urged to ready their kitchens for emergencies, developing disaster-ready cooking techniques, and then also dishing out sabameshi or survival meals. So what you see on your left is one of these cooking manuals um, where women should be ready for any emergencies. And then on the right, you see a poster of the uh, survival food contest, sabameshi contest, that took place in Sendai in Tohoku. Household decluttering, popularized by Konmari, was another crisis management skill where housewives would secure furniture, remove clutters, and stack up cups and then plates in a disaster-resistant manner. And then even though in the United States, uh, Konmari, Marie Kondo, has been very popular, in the post-311 context, Kunizaki no Bue played a really salient role. Lest women forget what items to carry and then what actions to pursue in times of crisis, a special washcloth, Bosai Tenugui, 14 by 40 inches, was designed by one of the studio in Iwate, reminding women of a to-do list and then promising to wipe off nugu, hazards and then disasters. Another local project, project situated in Tohoku called Fuko no Noroshi, or a beacon of rebirth, created a series of posters depicting local resolve in a deeply gendered manner. So one of them is this um, image or the poster with the caption, Shioretecha Otoko ga Staru, which according to their translation um, is got to be a real man about it. And this is really in a stark contrast to another poster which features women, which is this one. 
ご飯を作れる幸せ。Finally home to the simple joy of cooking for the family. Now, it is not only adults who are being mobilized,、um, children too are being mobilized to this new culture. So, juvenile literature circulated countless tales of exemplary deeds of Japanese and then American, quite often American soldiers, during and then after the disaster.、Um, this is one of the examples.、Um, eight volume children's stories published by Gakken.、Um, And then these stories quite often focus on the story of American and Japanese soldiers. So the popularity or the circulation of military discourse is really a salient feature. And then during the after the occupation, as many of you know, the image of children with soldiers or soldiers with children are really circulated. The importance of the military is also observed in the 2016 science fiction film Shin Godzilla that displayed heroism, bravery, and dedication of members of the JSDF, Japanese Self Defense Forces, as they tackled a disaster triggered by the monster. According to Prime Minister Abe Shinzo, the film's popularity was a clear indication of the public endorsement of the JSDF, Japanese Self Defense Forces. So, Godzilla became so popular. So, as you see on the left,、um, the image of the、uh, film poster was utilized to publicize the recruitment drive of the JSDF.、Um, that's the one on the left. On the right,、um, you see Godzilla with a flashlight and then also emergency bag. And then this is the image that was used to publicize disaster training in Osaka area. And then, certainly, examples involving military are not limited to this. Military technologies were adapted for civilian use in the disaster situations, promoting the so called dual use of military resources for civilian purposes and then articulating disaster militarism.、Um, this is just one example. This manual or the guidebook promises to transmit.、Um, Military soldiers' technologies among the civilians so that civilians can prepare for all the disasters and then calamities. A variety of terms circulated in post disaster Japan, including Kizuna, Bond, Ganbaro Nippon, Rise of Japan, and then Yoriso, which is this act of psychologically aligning oneself with the feelings of disaster victims, and then this is a、uh, cause. Championed by the imperial household and then also the JSDF alike. So, what you see on the left is a book um, that um, depicts or portrays、uh, members of the JSDF whose emotions are well aligned with those of the disaster victims. The image you, you see on the right、um, there is sort of this iconic image of Yoriso Kosu,、uh, imperial household, that aligns their emotions with those of the disaster、um, victims. And then、uh, two figures you see there are one Emperor Akihito and then another Empress Michiko, and they were engaging in really active、uh, c a m p a i g n toward the end、um, of their hate. Say rain. Now, importantly, the post 3 11 culture also mobilized Hula girls, thereby turning to the real and an imaginary space of the Pacific in order to resolve the national crisis. And this is not the first time that Japan turned to the Pacific so as to mobilize this vast region for ideological work they can do for Japan. So, early in the 20th century,、um, as you see on the left, the figure of adventurous Dankichi became very famous, representing one way in which、um, Japanese presence is、um, being recognized within the vast area of the Pacific. The one on the right,、um, Momotaro Peach Boys, but in this case, Peach Boys being transformed into Imperial Soldier and then once again being set in the Pacific. These are examples of the earlier time of the 20th century.、Uh, more recently, we had this image、uh, from Pokemon Sun and the Moon created by Nintendo. And this is the image of the、um, imaginary place called Alola. But this is actually a projection of the Japanese imagination of Hawaii in the 1980s when Japanese tourism was really at its height. 
So Momotaro, Adventures Dankichi, Pokemon, and of course Godzilla, these are sort of the signs and then symbols of Japanese presence in the Pacific. And then certainly the Pacific once, once again was mobilized um, after 311. Scarcely two months after the disaster, the Kizuna Caravan, so-called the Kizuna Caravan, was launched by the spa resort Hawaiians in Iwaki, Fukushima, a multiplex spa resort known for its Polynesian-themed review featuring young dancers from Tohoku. Dispatching its dancers on a goodwill tour across Japan, the caravan spread the spirit of aloha, aloha no kokoro, and then fosters kizuna, or bond, across the disaster-struck nation. The iconic status the hula girls gained after 311 was highlighted in June 2018, when Emperor Akihito and then Empress Michiko visited the region. Spending a night at the resort, the couple enjoyed the performance presented by the hula girls. Deeply touched by the royal visit, lead dancer Suzuki Haruna carefully stated as follows. We have been able to move forward since the disaster because the emperor and the empress have repeatedly visited our community. We cherish this feeling of gratitude and then continue to make progress. In post 311 Japan, the significance of Hawaii was indeed hard to ignore and there are many other examples that showcase the importance of Hawaii. Hawaii was the place where the term Operation Tomodachi or Operation Friendship purportedly originated. And then that's the uh, military, international military operation that engaged in rescue operation through and then after the disaster. Hawaii was also a site of so-called healing tours or hoyo ryoko, including this one very well-known project, Rainbow for Japan Kids which brought hundreds of Japanese children from Fukushima, Miyagi, and then Iwate to the tropical paradise for its healing power and an aloha spirit. Involved in the endeavor were Japanese American volunteers, local national and transnational corporations, civic organizations, and the Consulate General of Japan in Honolulu. And then this is one of the uh, uh, pictures of their meeting in Honolulu. Um, the figure you see um, right in the middle, this is Irene Hirano Inoue, uh, who headed US-Japan Council, and that's one of the uh, civic organizations that played a very conspicuous role in this endeavor. Finally, Hawaii provided the platform for Nikai Toshihiro, LDP, Liberal Democratic Party's elder statement and architect of Kokudo Kyojinka or National Resilience. Invited to speak at the University of Hawaii Manoa in 2017, Nikai, flanked by LDP escorts whose dark suits were in stark contrast to the Aloha shirts worn by Japanese Americans who packed the room, spoke about the significance of safety and security in the Pacific region. So he talked about the significance of building kizuna or building connection between um, Japan and then Hawaii with the local Hawaii's Japanese American as a conduit. So what are the main arguments of my presentation today and also um, of my book um, on which this presentation is based? The 2011 Great East Japan disaster ushered in a new era of cultural production in Japan where new discourses and then practices concerning recovery and then reconstruction, readiness and then preparedness, and then safety and security proliferated on an unprecedented scale. Unlike post-disaster protest movements that have at attracted much attention, this other mobilization centered on resilience has mostly escaped critical attention of scholars. So there is much talk about all these resistance mobilization or protest mobilization, but not about this other mobilization, resilience mobilization, Kokudo Kyojinka mobilization that I'm looking at today. So today I want to focus on this emerging regime of resi resilience with a special attention to Hawaii, whose significance as an offshore site of Japan's refortification drive merits careful analysis, I think. While much of the analysis of 311 and then its aftermath um, Sorry, uh, while much of the analysis of 311 and its aftermath have been said within Japan's domestic context, 
post-disaster mobilization has in fact drawn its energy from regional and then global dynamics as well, making it necessary, very necessary, to denationalize our discussion on 3.11 and then try to avoid the reiteration or reification of the national in scholarly discourses, as many um, studies do. And I think that reiteration or reification of things national would in the increasingly um, nationalistic environment in Japan sort of makes us think about the implication of the kind of scholarly work we all do. In recasting 311, I find three areas of studies um, to be particularly useful and particularly pertinent to mention today. First and foremost, a disaster holds the generative power in seismic as well as cultural terms. As Anthony Oliver Smith, anthropologist, argues, disaster is never a natural or neutral event that simply happens, but then rather a multiplicity of interwoven and often conflicting social constructions. In the wake of catastrophic events, individual and then institutional actors participate in meaning-making activities as they attempt to come to terms, to understand what has happened, and to develop strategies to gain some degrees of control. Now, the generative nature, productive nature of disaster is also observed by Alexander de Waal, um, who is a long-term observer of humanitarian crisis in Africa, and this is what he has to say. Disaster preparedness, prevention, relief, and then recovery, all words loaded with semi-submerged moral values are in fact mechanisms of disaster management, whereby calamities are not in fact prepared for, prevented, relieved, or recovered from, but then rather are handled in such a way that they pose the minimum political threat to government. So one area that I want to call the attention to in particular today is this area of disaster studies. Now, the second area, and then this has to do with resilience. Secondly, 311 and then its aftermath, most often framed as a national event, is in fact inseparable from global dynamics. As Jonathan Joseph points out, resilience is a key concept in neoliberal culture that insists on the ability to withstand and then survive shocks and disturbances, and then also insists on the capacity to thrive in the face of challenge. Resilience acts as a means to create adaptable subjects capable of adapting to and then exploiting situations of radical uncertainty. A leading governance discourse since 2005 when um, UN defined resilience um, as such. Resilience advocates such things as individual preparedness, making informed decisions, understanding our roles and responsibilities, and showing adaptability to our situation and then being able to bounce back. And then this dynamic of resilience creates other related dynamics. So as David Harvey argues, a proliferation of neoliberalism triggers a renewed articulation of nationalism, whose emphasis on morality, solidarity, and tradition seeks to counter instability, insecurity, and disorders generated by the emerging system, which is predicated on optimization, individualism, and competition. So uh, the rise of neoliberalism quite often goes hand in hand with the rise of nationalism or neoconservatism. And then finally, as neoliberalism circulates in tandem with militarism in the contemporary world, they constitute the two sides of the same coin of geopolitical dynamics that shape the 21st century. And at the center of all these dynamics that I've been talking about is gender, which is the third area that I want to emphasize today, whose centrality in post 311 culture is hard to ignore, as suggested by the examples that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. So whether we are looking at arm, a special issue, or talking about decluttering of the household, or all these survival meals, we are talking about disciplinary dynamics surrounding the women's body and the mind. We are also talking about the mobilization of women as chief crisis managers and also chief agents of post-disaster welfare. We are also talking about militarization of domesticity to the extent that the home is turned into a major site of defense against calamities. 
but in addition to or in relationship to these dynamics, I want to call the attention particularly to the work of Indapur Gruel. Um, her book is titled Saving the Security State and her insights regarding gendered securitization in post 9-11 American politics as they are especially useful in studies of 3-11. Following the September 11 terrorist attacks, Gruel argues, American citizen subjects who have been produced as responsible and self-improving and therefore products of neoliberal self-empowerment regimes have begun to take the task of defense into their own hands. Emerging in this process are the new category of subjects, such as security mobs, security feminists, and insecurity girls, who negotiate the mounting in insecurity triggered by the global war on terrorism, economic precarity, and then political retrenchment in their own gendered manners. The gendered and gendering dynamics identified by Gruel are salient in post-disaster Japan as well, where Japanese women have been enlisted and then also enlisting themselves as bosai mothers, disaster ready mothers, bosai housewives, bosai girls, and then even bosai feminists, promoting the safety and security of family, community, and nation as feminine and then quite often feminist subjects. And among these women are the hula girls who I consider and then analyze as one variant or one strand of both side girls or security girls. So let us now move into the main topic of my presentation today, which is the hula girls and then their quite often surprising connection to resilience culture in post 311 Japan. Following the 2011 disaster, the spa resort Hawaiians, um, this is the establishment, entertainment established, establishment that I mentioned earlier, became a ground zero of resilience mobilization. An imaginary Hawaii recreated in the cold country Tohoku, a region, a region long viewed as Japan's other and an even savage Northeast. The resort provided a staging arena for post-disaster national recovery and then reconstruction animating new cultural production in a complex and then sometimes surprising manner. And two narratives um, that I want to introduce today capture these two, uh, these dynamics. So let me talk about the first uh, narrative, uh, which is this book. The 2011 children's book, Hula Girl and Her Pet Dog Choco, Furagaruto Inu no Choko is an example of a new genre of juvenile disaster literature that really proliferated in the post disaster um, nation Japan. Set in disaster struck Fukushima, the story, based on a real life event, presents an intertwined narrative of tenacity and then survival of Omori Rie, her stage name Moana Rie, a young hula dancer at the resort, and her beloved Choko a female dog that belongs to her family. So more than anything else, this is a feminine-centered or female-centered narrative. The story begins with Rie's childhood in Tohoku. Visiting the resort, young Rie was entranced by the vision of a tropical paradise and beautiful dancers. The impression was so deep, she began to nurture and an ambition to one day become a hula girl, a dream she eventually realized with the help of her pet dog, Choco. Joining the spa resort Hawaiians, she became an employee of Joban Kosan, which is the operating company of the resort, thereby sustaining family tradition, in which her great grandfather had once worked as a coal miner for Joban Tanko, which is the predecessor of Joban Kosan. So, more than anything else, this narrative, the story, is set in the coal mining region. The story illustrates the gendered aspiration of a young girl and the family legacy of hard labor in the peripheral mining community of Joban. The March 11 disaster changed the lives of Rie and then Choko forever. Following the explosion at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, high levels of radiation spread to neighboring communities, including Rie's hometown, Futabamachi. All residents were ordered to evacuate, leaving homes, personal belongings, and pet animals behind. Although Rie's family left Fukushima, 
Rie, who was forever loyal, decided to stay with other Hula girls in Iwaki. Choko was left in Futabamachi by then an irradiated ghost town with no sign of human occupation. Following this dramatic turn of events, the story proceeds with two narrative voices, Dies as well as Choko's, with each articulating her personal resolve, resourcefulness, and then also resilience. Left alone, Choko soon began to feel loneliness and then hunger. Running out of food, she ventured out, befriending other dogs, building a community of support, and then acquiring survival skills along the way. Forced to beg for food from other dogs and even to eat refuse on occasions, Choco learned how to adjust her expectations and then cope with post-disaster circumstances. In the meantime, Rie was charting her own course of action as a member of the Kizuna caravan, helping to forge Kizuna bond across Japan. Visiting an evacuation facility in Saitama Prefecture, she found a group of evacuees from her hometown living in a converted school building. As Rie and then other Hula girls danced to the soothing tunes of Hawaiian music, some in the audience were brought to tears because the sight of the Hula girls reminded them of their home. Portraying a variety of challenges arising in the aftermath of the disaster, the story still concludes with a happy ending. After months of separation, Choco found her way to Rie thanks to the help of a volunteer animal rescue worker. And volunteers and volunteering, their significance also uh, rose considerably in post-311 culture. Against the exotic backdrop of Hawaii, the tale of a young woman and her pet dog, pet dog, uh, pet dog unfolds, celebrating feminine resilience, emphasizing the value of self and mutual help, and showcasing the virtue of kizuna. And then Omori Rie, uh, Moana Rie, who you see um, on the right hand side, that's her on the stage, after she retired from the uh, um, her performance career, um, because she became so well known, she actually continued to be an employee of Joe Van Kosen and then became a spokesperson and began to talk about how resilience and then Kizuna and then all these key concepts of resilience really part of DNA of women in Tohoku. So this is the first narrative. Now this first narrative is in great contrast to the second narrative now that, uh, that now I want to um, introduce. When Omoririe and then other hula girls at the resort reappear within the realm of business discourse, a different, far more male-centered vision of resilience begins to emerge. Shimiz Katsutoshi's book, Why Has Tohoku's Hawaii Been Able to Attain a V-Shaped Recovery, The Miracle of Spa Resort Hawaiians, presents a masculine tale of corporate crisis, survival, and resilience. Featured on its cover are the hula girls performing on stage with the phrase, Gyakkyo ni katsu kigyo no sokoji kara, the power of the corporation to overcome adversaries, articulating a link between economic resilience, managerial prowess, and female bodies. The book presents a masculine discourse of resilience centered on economic recovery, but then also a recovery or rejuvenation of local masculinity. Shimizu, the author, retraces the miracle of V-shaped recovery, linking it to the historical trajectory of energy industry in the Joban area or Joban region. Starting its operation in the late 19th century, the Joban coal field was once known for low-grade coal and underground thermal water interfering with its extraction. Despite these unfavorable circumstances, the region emerged as a leading supplier of energy because of its proximity to the Kanto Plain, the nation's center, um, that is where Tokyo is located. Among the mining companies operating in the area were Iwaki Tanko and Iriyama Saitam, established in 1884 and then 85 respectively, which merged to form Joban Tanko in 1944, so in the middle of World War II. Joban Tanko and then its successor Joban Kosan, that's now the operating company of the Spa Resort Hawaiian, are examples of Jiba Sangyo, according to Shimizu, a regional enterprise with deep roots in the local 
community. And as we are going to discover in a few minutes, actually disclaim that these um, enterprises are the examples of Jiba Sangyo or a local enterprise are not so inaccurate. There, there's far more complicated stories um, surrounding um, these enterprise or enterprises. Through World War II and in the immediate post-war years, the coal industry thrived due to wartime mobilization and then post-war reconstruction. Joba was so important, Showa Emperor, Emperor Hirohito, father of Emperor Akihito that I mentioned, and then um, I showed you a picture of earlier, um, visited um, this area, 1947. This boom came to an abrupt end, however, in the late 1950s, when the so-called energy revolution forced a sudden shift from domestic coal to foreign petroleum. Joban Tanko plunged into a crisis, a crisis of economy, but then also a crisis of masculinity. The man who successfully contained this crisis was Yutaka Nakamura or Nakamura Yutaka, a charismatic businessman nicknamed Emperor Nakamura. And she's, he's really an exemplar of one of these fossil masculinities where the articulation of masculinity is so intertwined with energy um, extraction and production and then also uh, distribution. As vice president of Joban Tanko, Nakamura began to reorganize the enterprise, setting up subsidiary companies in construction, electricity, consulting, medicine, and then food distribution. One of the enterprises that came out of this process was Joban Joint Power Company. And then because it was a joint operation, there are many partners. One of them was TEPCO, um, which by now is synonymous with the 2011 nuclear um, crisis. Um, the establishment of Joban Joint Power Company was so significant. So uh, Crown Prince Akihito and then Crown Princess Michiko later emperor and then empress visited um, this site in 1961. Nakamura also decided to build a hot spring resort, taking advantage of geothermal hot springs, hampering the underground mining operation. So the story is because of his excellent uh, business acumen, he was able to turn this advantage into a major advantage. The resort's origin story as recounted by Shimizu reads like a stirring narrative of masculine adventure set on the frontier of energy and tourism ventures. Faced with a crisis, Nakamura, a paragon of business renovation and innovation, valiantly pursued the principles of self-help and mutual help to rescue, save Joban. With no prior experience in construction, he studied architecture and drafted a blueprint for the resort. So he did everything in Jimaya manner, meaning self-sustaining manner. Eager to gain knowledge about the hospitality industry, Nakamura even traveled to Hawaii in 1964, where Polynesian-style performance is emerging as a major tourist attraction. And just a few years before his visit, his travel to Hawaii, Crown Prince Akihito and then Crown Princess Michiko were also visiting Hawaii in 1961. And then so that was right after the very famous wedding of 1959. And then those of you who are in Japanese studies know how that wedding was such an important turning point in Japan's um, national identity, really a moment of uh, reconfiguration of national identity in post-war Japan. Now, coming back to Nakamura. Returning to Fukushima, Nakamura launched a new enterprise, Joban Hawaiian Center, later Spa Resort Hawaiians, rebooting local economy, but then also rebooting local masculinity. As Shimizu, the author of the book, explains, the at the core of Nakamura's endeavor was Ichizan Ikka, literally meaning one mountain and one family, a traditional proverb in the region that celebrated the family-like unity or kizuna between employers and employees in the coal mining community. As Nakamura envisioned, the new resort would have former miners work at the front desk, their wives housekeep in the back, and their sons cook in the kitchen. Hiring professional dancers from Tokyo was unthinkable. Nakamura was insisted because, according to him, it was the sight of minors' daughters dancing and perspiring on stage that would touch the visitors' hearts and then ensure the resort's success. 
the first generation of hula girls was thus born, consisting of local miners' daughters with no dancing experience whatsoever. A new enterprise, which Nakamura called Joban no Takarazuka, Takarazuka in Joban Triumphed, opening its door in 1966, attracting more than 1.2 million visitors in its first year. So it is very interesting spa resort Hawaiian Takarazuka in Joban has a connection with another female um, dancing troupe, Takarazuka, um, that is situated or located in Western Japan. And Jennifer Robertson's work is really useful to, uh, to unpack the very interesting um, enterprise. Um, just to give you a little bit more sense about Joban Hawaiian Center, um, the image that you see on the left is the poster um, of the resort, um, the very first one at its opening. The picture on the right, um, you see the, uh, uh, the performance of the earlier generation of dancers with the term aloha showcased in the uh, back in a very conspicuous uh, manner. You see Emperor Nakamura um, in the image uh, on the left side, he's right in the middle and then the hula girls are wearing company um, uniforms. This is one of the uh, dancing instructors. This is the first group um, of the uh, uh, dancers in Joban. And then what you see in the backdrop or background is Zuriyama. This is the uh, um, mound or pile of wasted coal. The legacy of corporate leadership, risk management, and a masculine entrepreneurialism first articulated during the crisis in the 1950s and 60s was remobilized in the wake of the 2011 nuclear crisis. As Shimizu explains, Joban Kosan, by then Joban, Joban Kosan, was then under the leadership of Saito Kazuhiko, a man even more committed to Ichizan Ikka, one mountain and one family, as his father and grandfather had worked for Joban Tanko. In the face of another unprecedented crisis, Saido sprang into action. Forced to temporarily shut down the resort due to the infrastructural damage caused by the earthquake, Saido saw an investment opportunity, that's the term that was used, investment opportunity, sending staff members to other hotels for retraining and dispatching hula girls on a national tour of publicity. So once again, male leadership turned a disadvantage into an advantage. The campaign resulted in the nationwide popularity of hula girls and an unprecedented number of visitors following its, following its reopening in 2012. Initiating a remarkable rebound, V-shaped recovery, Saito proved himself to be an effective crisis manager and innovative business leader, articulating a new vision of corporate resilience and also corporate masculinity in post-311 Japan. In post-311 Japan then, the narratives of self-help and then mutual help, as exemplifi exemplified by female performers, corporate leaders, and then even pet animals, reverberated. Obsolete notion of Ichizan Ikka, one mountain and one family, whose premise of a lifelong bond between employers and employees is no longer the reality in Japan's neoliberal economy, increasingly reliant on fluid labor, has now been retooled to add a sense of timelessness and then also authenticity to the post-disaster resilience building. As the imperial figures who embody national unity and national yashi frequent the scene, their healing power amplifies and then is amplified by the healing power of hula girls. The comforting vision that's created begins to unravel, however, once we dig deeper into the multi-layered history of Joban. The region's landscape is haunted by various figures whose accounts of body, labor, and the empire create the noticeable cracks in the foundational narrative of the resort. So now let us recover and then rediscover the region's past, some of the underlying sort of the narratives of the history or even undercurrents that exist in the Joban area. And they really complicate this whole narrative or narratives of resilience that I have been talking about today. And I want to talk about two layers of um, history today. And so this is the first one. 
The history of Joban, where the spa resort Hawaiians now stands, is inseparable from that of the Japanese Empire, inseparable from the history of Japanese Empire. So the claim that the spa resort Hawaiian and its predecessors were, were Jibasanyo, locally situated enterprise, is really I an mean, inaccurate um, description. Emerging at the turn of the last century, Iwakitanko and then Iriyama Saitan, these two uh, coal mining companies, were operated by Asano and then Okura Zaibatsu. Zaibatsu being family conglomerates whose economic activities drove Japanese expansionism. The slogan of Ichizan Ikka, one mountain and one family, a symbol of post uh, 311 resilience, actually emerged in this context, expansionist context, a political tool devised to contain labor disputes during the 1920s economic recession. A provider of role resources, Joban became even more deeply entrenched in the politics of empire when Korean miners began to arrive to provide cheap labor in the 1940s, so in the middle of World War II as their testimonials reveal. And then these are testimonials of the Korean workers who worked for Iwakitanko and then Iriyama Saitan specifically. So as their testimonials reveal, Korean laborers not only endured the harsh working conditions characterized by frequent accidents, injury, and death. They were subject to constant bodily surveillance and regulations as, exempl as exemplified by the high wooden walls erected around their dorm trees with barbed wire placed on top. Clearly, the kizuna or the bond that bound these Korean workers' fate to the colonizer Japan was of a very violent nature. The destructive war ended in 1945, but then these practices did not cease to exist. Local women hula dancers at the Joban Hawaiian Center became a new target of labor discipline and then labor exploitation. Living in the dormitory surrounded by barbed wires, these daughters of former coal miners, Japanese coal miners, were feminized commodities whose bodies and also whose sweat, remember they have to perspire on the stage, whose sweat were enlisted to resolve a post-war economic crisis. Another layer of history or another undercurrent running through Joban is this. So this is the second historical tale I want to share with you today. Recall Nakamura Yutaka, a charismatic male leader nicknamed Emperor Nakamura. His visit to Hawaii in 1964, a crucial event in the resort's foundation, entailed a meeting with an individual named Akiyoshi Hayashida, Director of International Hospitality at the Hawaii Visitors Bureau. And it was actually Hayashida who took um, Nakamura to the Polynesian Cultural Center, a very important site in terms of the island's tourism. Um, Hayashida also gave the resort um, the name Joban Hawaiian Center, so he became a godparent of a sort. Now, this meeting between Hayashida and then Nakamura was mediated by another Japanese American. Senator Daniel Inoue, who is also like sort of the, the king-like or emperor-like um, figure. So this is um, Daniel Inoue, and then his uh, military connection is really deep and then long. So, um, and then that legacy is being embodied by this USS Daniel um, Inoue. The image that I showed you very quickly, um, this is also giving you some sense of Joban um, at the uh, turn of the century. This is early 20th century image of Do. Uh, Jovan, really a coal mining um, uh, community. Um, to make sure you know where the locations are, this is where uh, Spa Resort Hawaiian, Jovan Hawaiian Center uh, are located. And then Tokyo is right here. So you can see um, so the proximity between these two um, areas. Now, getting back to the story of um, Daniel Inoue, a senator from Hawaii, and then who played a very crucial role in Nakamura's visit to Hawaii. Uh, Inoue was a Nisei war hero who had lost his right arm on the battlefield in Europe. 
and he used his missing limb as an incontestable evidence of his patriotism as he became a really well-known figure uh, first locally and then later nationally challenging anti-Japanese racism and then entering into the realm of national politics, he channeled an enormous number of federal dollars to military-related projects in the island, transforming Hawaii into a leading Cold War security state in the United States. Therefore, embedded in the foundation of the spa resort Hawaiians is a trans-Pacific link between two patriarchal leaders. One was Nakamura, and then the other one is Inoue, and then also two patriarchal empires, Japan and the United States, making post-311 resilience building a trans-historical and then also transnational endeavor with complex implications. Now, the legacy of Daniel Inoue continues being sustained by his widow, Irene Hirano Inoue, in the post-Cold War Pacific. The Rainbow for Japan Kids, um, that's that uh, healing tourism project I mentioned at the beginning of my talk today that brought many Tohoku children to um, Hawaii. Um, the Rainbow for Japan Kids was part of the U.S. Japan Council's Tomodachi Initiative a multifaceted youth exchange program of staggering proportion successfully executed by Irene Hirano Inoue. Inspired by the Operation Tomodachi actually taking its name from the Operation of Tomodachi and capitalizing on the spirit of Aloha, the initiative a stellar example of public and private partnership involving the U.S. and Japanese governments and then corporations invest, that's the language they use, invest in children as a future asset whose kizuna building capacity is deemed essential in the region's security. A powerhouse in her own right, Hirano Inoue, former president of the Japanese American National Museum, former chair of the Ford Foundation Board of Trustees, and then also a staunch advocate of women's empowerment, embodied a link between militarism and neoliberalism and then feminism. Clearly, Hirano, Hirano Inoue is an example of security girl whose indomitable performance complements and then also complicates the performance of another security girls, that is, hula girls at the spa resort Hawaiians. In conclusion, Japan's post-311 resilience building is a transnational and transhistorical project of exceptional magnitude and exceptional dynamism. Hawaii serves as one of its epicenters whose involvement illuminates the legacies of race, nation, and an empire from the past, while also promulgating a new vision of resilience for the neoliberalizing and militarizing present and then future. In ways not yet fully acknowledged, Hawaii serves as an unlikely starting point, indeed impetus, for critical thinking of resilience politics proliferating in Japan and then also nowadays proliferating in the broader region of the Pacific. Now, a very brief coda. I finished writing this book in early March last year, um, year two, uh, 2020. Having sent the final version to my editor at the press, I thought I could take a break from all thoughts of hazards and then disasters. I could not be more wrong. As the pandemic began to envelop the world, a call for resilience spread like a wildfire, defining self-help and the mutual help as a chief means of containment and then survival. The dancers at the spa resort Hawaiians were enlisted as health advocates, displaying masks made out of Hawaiian prints, which also adorned their bodies. A new tenugui, remember washcloth, a new tenugui was designed this time um, uh, focused on COVID-19 and then its prevention. And then you see it's a very small print, but if you come closer to the uh, screen, you might be able to see it. Among other things, they provide instruction about um, how to make a mask out of this Borsai Tenugri so that you can be doubly protected. How to combat your house in your heart and then spark joy during the lockdown became a popular topic covered by the NPR, Washington Post, and then also New York Times. Perhaps most ingenious of all is a new initiative called Kizu Naroha. 
combining two effective terms, kizuna and an aloha. Kizuna Aloha is an economic recovery initiative whose aim is to engage the Japanese market and then also secure Japanese tourists for the post-COVID future. Spearheaded by Paul Yonamine at the Central Pacific Bank and then endorsed by Governor Ige, the initiative with its promotional video featuring a hula dancer, once again, of course, articulates a 21st century version of Hula Girls in which a premise and a promise of resilient future seems rather elusive as it relies on and repeats the old script of safety and then security whose efficacy has already been called into question by the current crisis. <laughs> 